Good afternoon. Welcome uh, to today's Grand Rounds presentation. Please remember to sign the attendance record at the back of the auditorium, and also please remember to fill out the program uh, evaluation. And the CME committee is always appreciative of any ideas that you might have in uh, regards to future topics or future speakers. Uh, today, it's uh, my great pleasure to reintroduce, actually, Dr. Amy Oxentenko. Uh, Dr. Oxentenko is uh, an internist and a gastroenterologist. She is a fellow in the ACP and also in the American College of Gastroenterology. Currently, she is an associate professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine. She's a consultant in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the Mayo Clinic. She's the program director and associate chair in the Department of Internal Medicine at the Mayo Clinic, and uh, she also was the... Uh, editor of the uh, GI and hepatology section uh, in the uh, MKSAP 16 and the upcoming MKSAP 17. Um, she provided us with, a, with a, a great review of celiac disease about a year ago and she kindly uh, accepted our invitation to come back today to provide us uh, with uh, some GI clinical pearls. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Oxentenko. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me back. So this is going to be um, a very interactive presentation. So hopefully everyone grabbed an audience response keypad when you came in. Um, I'm, I designed this talk, in, again, in clinical pearls. And I'm not sure if you've had some of the other clinical pearls kind of sessions here. So what I'll do is I will pose a case, a, sh a short clinical scenario in a multiple choice question sort of format. And the goal of each question is to really have one teaching point or teaching pearl that you can take away from the case. So we'll try to get through as many cases as we can. I've really tried to pick the cases from the large number of the GI guidelines that's, that have come out in the last year or two. So some of the, the questions and the content may seem quite basic, but I tried to pick things from some of the guidelines that I see are either things that are either not often done in practice, maybe not done um, in a, as cost-effective approach as possible. So I tried to hone in on some of those things. All right, so let's start with the first case. A 38-year-old man prevents, presents for an evaluation of heartburn and acid regurgitation that's been present for several months. He's also noted a new cough that coincides with the onset of his GI symptoms. He denies dysphagia or weight loss. So which of the following would you do next? One, EGD with esophageal biopsies, ambulatory pH testing, H. pylori serology, esophageal manometry, or proton pump inhibitor trial. So if you have your keypad, just enter your answer, and uh, we'll see what people think. If there are people that are missing a keypad and want one, you can maybe raise your hand, and we could try to get you one if you'd want one. All right, so let's see what people selected. So 53% chose option five, a proton pump inhibitor trial, which I think is the best answer in this case. So again, to establish a diagnosis of reflux disease, you can establish this diagnosis based on just typical heartburn symptoms regurgitation. I think this patient had that in the absence of any alarm symptoms, such as dysphagia, odynophagia, weight loss. And the guidelines suggest that when you have typical features like that, an empiric PPI trial is what is recommended. You certainly don't need to do an upper endoscopy for typical reflux symptoms, again, as long as there are no alarm features. So when is it recommended? It's certainly recommended if someone presents with weight loss and new reflux symptoms, or they have odynophagia, dysphagia, any of those other features, or it would be recommended in someone who you've done that PPI trial and they're still having ongoing symptoms, then an EGD would be recommended. If the EGD, once you need it, is done and is negative, and again, your patient has pretty typical symptoms for reflux disease, that's where the, the role of pH impedance testing is recommended. So in the past, we would do ambulatory pH testing. Um, now, at least at Mayo, what we do is it's always combined with impedance testing. And what impedance testing is, is it detects not only acid regurgitation, but it really detects fluid regurgitation, whether acid or non-acid, because we have patients that are on a PPI and still have heartburn-related symptoms from non-acid reflux. So impedance testing will give us that information in terms of are they having regurgitation and is it acidic or alkaline in nature. And always remember, and this is true for clinical purposes as well as for any kind of recertification, that with chest pain, even though you may think it's from reflux because of typical associated reflux symptoms, 
you certainly always need to rule out a cardiac etiology before just putting them on a PPI trial. So an eight-week trial is the therapy of choice, just once a day in the morning, 30 to 60 minutes before the first meal. And there's probably no major difference between PPIs based on what the guidelines say. I think we all have patients that will tell us that they certainly respond better to one PPI uh, compared to another, so I think that's helpful. Again, taking them 30 to 60 minutes before meals allows for maximum control. And so I think if you have a patient who you've put on a PPI trial and they haven't responded, the first important thing is to make sure they're taking their medication accurately. Again, once a day before the first meal of a day. If you have a patient who says, I'm never a breakfast eater, or all of my symptoms occur in the night, or they wake me up from sleep, then you certainly can do that once daily PPI trial with that PPI dose before the evening meal or the lunch meal as appropriate. You don't need to do twice daily PPI uh, trial at the onset. You can go to that dose if someone either has a partial response to once daily therapy, or again, if someone has breakthrough symptoms at night, then, it, then you could certainly add a, tw a second dose in the evening hours. We know that if you stop PPI therapy on people and they have ongoing reflux disease, they'll have recurrent symptoms. So there's really probably little harm in putting someone on a long-term PPI if once you've tried to stop the PPI, they have recurrence of symptoms. And so that, that would be fine. There's lots of, obviously, literature that's come out in the last few years about potential concerns of long-term PPI use in terms of bone disease and vitamin absorption. But in people who truly need it because of ongoing symptoms, the, the risk of untreated reflux disease is probably higher than the risk of some of those um, side effects. Always putting someone, though, on the lowest effective dose, including for some people it may be just on demand or when they need it rather than once every single day should be the goal of therapy. So there are people who can, you know, again, on demand just use H2 blockers and not need a PPI. So I think if someone responds to a PPI trial, you certainly can step down to H2 blockers in someone who has non-erosive disease, meaning no evidence of esophagitis if they've needed an upper endoscopy. One thing that's commonly done in practice is to put someone on a, a bedtime H2 blocker for breakthrough symptoms. That's, that's okay and that's done commonly in practice, but just know that patients develop tachyphylaxis, meaning after s several weeks of that, they'll often use the, lose the effectiveness of that nighttime H2 blockade. The guidelines suggest that we really should not use non-acid suppressing medications. Um, commonly, we'll see prokinetics being added to someone's regimen. Um, so it's recommended that you don't add those things unless someone has undergone an evaluation for their symptoms, just because of the side effects are quite great with some of those medications. If someone goes to an upper endoscopy because of a significant reflux and they're found to have severe esophagitis, and by severe, there's four grades of esophagitis, A, B, C, or D, C and D being the most severe. If someone has severe esophagitis, and your goal during that upper endoscopy was also to allow us to rule out Barrett's esophagus, it may be really challenging. So those patients really probably ought to have a repeat EGD once their esophagitis has been managed to really look for Barrett's if that's the goal of your endoscopy. The other um, thing that's recommended in the guideline, and this is nothing new, but if someone has had a peptic or reflux-induced stricture and that stricture is dilated during upper endoscopy, Ongoing PPI therapy is recommended for that individual because that's been shown to re, uh, prevent recurrence of that peptic stricture, so that would be recommended long term. So all of these um, recommendations that I just went through came out in the ACG guideline 2013 in the American Journal of Gastroenterology, and I have the reference there for you. So the clinical pearl here is a presumptive diagnosis of reflux can be made based on symptoms of typical heartburn and regurgitation in the absence of alarm symptoms, and an empiric PPI trial is recommended. All right, case two. A 42-year-old man presents with two bouts of hematemesis. He's healthy and takes ibuprofen as needed for back pain. On presentation, he's hemodynamically stable. His hemoglobin is 8.7. IV PPI is started, and EGD reveals a clean-based ulcer in the stomach. So what should the following would you do next? Repeat the EGD in 24 hours, transfuse red blood cells, continue IV PPI therapy, clear diet for 72 hours, or dismiss to home. 
right, let's see what people have selected. So many people, 48% uh, decided to continue the PPI, IV PPI therapy. Only 15% selected dismissed to home, which I think in this case uh, may not be an unreasonable answer. And I, I would feel that that might be the best answer in this case. So again, to review these guidelines, peptic ulcer disease bleeding guidelines that have come out in the last uh, year. So just again, a few pearls related to upper GI bleeding. So pre-upper endoscopy erythromycin can be given to increase the yield on the first upper endoscopy and possibly decrease the need for repeat EGD. So erythromycin really helps stimulate motility of the stomach. It empties any blood that might be sitting there. So it allows for a best first inspection. EGD should be performed within the first 24 hours, obviously sooner if someone's at higher clinical risk or they're um, hemodynamically unstable. There's really no need anymore based on the guidelines for nasogastric lavage, and that's because we can be falsely reassured by a negative lavage when someone still could have upper GI bleeding. Again, not part of this guideline, but based on recent papers that have come out in the last few years, we now know that there's really probably no need to transfuse unless the hemoglobin is less than or uh, equal to seven, obviously unless there's ongoing blood loss and the patient is having gross hematemesis in front of you or features of significant volume depletion, which this patient did not have. Um, once we do an endoscopy, the endoscopic features help us depict what we need to do with the patient. So if when we look down and we see an ulcer and there's active bleeding from the ulcer base, there's a visible vessel or an adherent clot, the guidelines would recommend that we apply endoscopic therapy. We give IV PPI therapy with a bolus and continued infusion. We should keep them on a clear liquid diet. And we know that they, these folks are at the highest risk of rebleeding. So these patients should be observed for up, for se up to 72 hours. However, those patients who have a flat spot, a flat pigmented spot, or a clean-based ulcer, which this patient had, um, there's no need to apply endoscopic therapy because the risk of rebleeding is quite low. You can switch them immediately to oral PPI therapy. You can initiate a regular diet and dismiss them to home. So obviously, you're going to have close clinical follow-up to make sure they don't have recurrence of bleeding and be in close communication. Um, but again, in the era of high-value cost-conscious care, these patients can be dismissed fairly readily from the hospital. There's no need for a second look at EGD in 24 hours, unless, of course, in a unique clinical scenario um, and you didn't get a good look the first time, that would otherwise not be recommended. The other things based on this guideline is that if a patient has an ulcer and you've deemed it to be from H. pylori infection, obviously you treat the H. pylori, and once you've confirmed eradication, that patient does not need ongoing PPI therapy outside of the course of the um, H. pylori um, regimen. If the ulcer is deemed to be from NSAIDs, we do all of the typical things you ought to do. Stop the NSAIDs if possible. If that's not possible, either switch to the lowest effective dose or consider switching to a COX-2 inhibitor. But in either case, that patient would need a PPI for gastric protection. Um, and if that patient needs to be on that medication continually, then they need to be on a PPI to prevent a recurrent ulcer bleed. We also know that based on some of the cardiac literature that if someone was on an aspirin and that's the only NSAID type of medication they were on during their peptic ulcer bleed, um, we really should restart this aspirin in one to three days to prevent cardiovascular mortality in that group of patients. If the ulcer is idiopathic, meaning no H. pylori and they're not on an NSAID, then those patients should be on long-term PPI because, again, their risk of rebleeding when we don't know what caused the ulcer is fairly high. And again, all of this information came out in the ACG practice guideline 2012. So the clinical pearl here is that in patients with peptic ulcer disease and low risk of rebleeding based on endoscopic features, no endoscopic therapy is needed, an oral PPI and a regular diet can be initiated, and patients can be readily dismissed with appropriate follow-up. All right, next case. A 58-year-old man presents for a routine examination. He has known coronary artery disease and underwent placement of a drug-eluting stent 10 months ago. He is on both aspirin and clopidogrel. He asks about a colonoscopy and wonders what he should do with his aspirin and clopidogrel for that study. In review of his last colonoscopy done at age 55, he had two tubular adenomas with low-grade dysplasia that were 5 and 8 millimeters that were both removed, otherwise normal exam. He has no family history of colorectal neoplasia. 
So which of the following would be recommended? Continue the aspirin and clopidogrel during the colonoscopy. Stop the clopidogrel one week before the colonoscopy, staying on aspirin. Stop the aspirin and clopidogrel for one week before the colonoscopy or delay the colonoscopy. All right, so 39% uh, opted to delay the colonoscopy, which I think is probably the best answer here, and some opted to continue both medications. So in this particular case, the reason to delay the colonoscopy is this gentleman is three years status post his last colonoscopy. Based on the polyps that he had, he does not need a three-year interval between endoscopies, and he's probably still in that high-risk interval with his stent. And so if you're going to do the colonoscopy and it's really for polyp surveillance, you want to be able to remove any new polyps that have formed. And so in this case, three years is too soon for a surveillance interval for this person. No sooner than five years would be recommended based on the size and number of his polyps. So I think delaying the colonoscopy until at least five years would be recommended. And then you could really have a conversation, does he need both aspirin and clopidogrel at that time um, versus not? And if, he, if you want to stop one of them, his risk of stopping the clopidogrel two years from now would be lower than it is now. So the answer here is delay the colonoscopy. So when we're talking about antiplatelet and anticoagulation and endoscopy, boy, there's been so many papers that have come out recently about all of these new antiplatelet and anticoagulant agents. It's really uh, challenging, at least for me, to keep them all straight, know what to do differently with each one. The first step, and the most important, as this case illustrates, is make sure the endoscopy is indicated. So if the risk of stopping the antiplatelet agent or the anticoagulant is greater than the benefit that you're going to achieve from that endoscopy, delay the colonoscopy or the endoscopy, especially if it's elective. The second step is really understanding not only the risk of bleeding with the procedure planned, but also the risk and uh, timeline of the various antiplatelet and anticoagulant medications. So again, these are things that it's really hard to commit to memory, but these are ref uh, helpful reference things to come back to. So in the past, we had aspirin and clopidogrel. We know that if these both irreversibly inhibit platelets, and we'd have to have at least seven days before platelets would have their uh, full function back. So obviously, uh, new in the last few years are prazugril and ticagrelor, um, both which also uh, inhibit platelet function, one irreversibly like the others, and one reversibly. And you can see the biggest difference here is prazugril has a longer time needed to platelet recovery. So if you stop someone's uh, prazugril for only seven days, they pr still probably have some risk of bleeding. Whereas ticagrelor has a time to platelet recovery of up to five days, so a shorter interval. So again, you could scope someone after stopping that medication for five to seven days, and their risk of bleeding would be significantly decreased. Anticoagulants have also grown in number, uh, making us uh, having to be more familiar with these medications and their risk. So in addition to warfarin, which I think we all feel very comfortable with, now we have gab uh, dabigatron, rivaroxaban, and apixaban. They all act through different mechanisms, and I think the, th the point of this slide that I want to make is they all are renally excreted to different degrees. And so ones that are more heavily renally excreted are more dependent on creatinine clearance. And so if you have a patient who has poor renal function, you're going to need to hold that medication for more days before their um, clotting ability has recovered. So I think that's important to know. Each uh, institution may have different guidelines within their institution of how long they require you to hold these medications before an endoscopy. But again, if they're dependent on renal function, you may need to hold them longer based on their creatinine clearance. But coming back to the risk of the procedure, the thing that's important to know is that many of the procedures that we do are deemed low risk. So an EGD, flexig, or colonoscopy, even if we take mucosal biopsies, are all deemed low risk procedures. If we do an ERCP without a planned sphincterotomy, if we put in a stent or remove it, um, if we do an endoscopic ultrasound without sticking any needles and things, all of these are low risk procedures. And you can see, regardless of which antiplatelet or anticoagulant someone's on, 
you could really safely do those procedures with those medications continued. Now, certainly, if someone's INR was 4.7, you wouldn't do it. It assumes that their INR is within a therapeutic limit, not super therapeutic. Um, you also, though, have to counsel a patient. You have to wonder why is the endoscopy de being done. And if it's being done for polyp surveillance and you find a polyp, you have to counsel them that they may need to come back for a second endoscopy if these anticoagulants aren't stopped because it will be safer for polyp removal. So again, you have to weigh this against why you're doing the endoscopy. And if it's something that is higher risk of needing to do more invasive things, um, then you may want to hold the, hold the medication in that case. But again, just for a diarrhea evaluation where you're getting biopsies, these medications don't need to be held. On the other hand, high-risk procedures, which include upper endoscopy where you plan to do a dilation, a planned uh, or potential polypectomy, or any of the other things listed which are much more invasive, um, then you really want to try to control, obviously, their coagulation status. So keeping their INR below a therapeutic limit would be recommended. And all of the others, again, it's going to be, it may be institution dependent. I think the guidelines may be a little more helpful as we're seeing them coming out. But what we see is for our institution, it's based on our creatinine clearance of how long someone's uh, apixaban and those sorts of things uh, need to be held. On the other hand, when you get to the antiplatelet agents, you can see here that, that um, you know, you need to hold them dependent on, again, the time for recovery of platelet function, longest for prazugril, shortest for ticagrelor. Um, certainly, if you have someone that's not, at high, not only they're getting a high-risk procedure, but let's say they're also at very high risk of thrombosis, then that's when you're going to want to work with either your neurologist, if it's for a neurologic reason they're on these medications, or the cardiologist to decide if bridging therapy is needed when you're holding these medications. So the clinical pearl here is when determining the need to hold antiplatelet and anticoagulant medications for endoscopy, first determine the urgency of the procedure and then determine the risk of bleeding based on the procedure planned and then also weigh that against um, the risk of bleeding and time need needing to hold for each of those medications individually. All right, case four, a 60-year-old male undergoes a CT colonography for colorectal cancer screening given he has a prosthetic aortic valve for prior symptomatic bicuspid valve and is on anticoagulation. He also has a pacemaker due to sick sinus syndrome. The CT colonoscopy or colonography reveals a one centimeter polyp in the descending colon, so he's advised to undergo a colonoscopy to further evaluate uh, and polyp removal. So in addition to addressing his anticoagulation, he asks about antibiotics. He has allergic uh, reaction to cephalexin. So which is recommended prior to his colonoscopy? No antibiotics, amoxicillin, ampicillin and gentamicin, vancomycin or clindamycin. All right, let's see what people have selected. All right, 47% shows no antibiotics, which is the best answer here. So you might be catching on. Really, these four, first four cases are really about doing no harm and being very cost effective in your approach if that's warranted. So in this case, there's no antibiotics indicated either for his valve or his pacemaker. So if you look at prophylactic antibiotics for endoscopic procedures, um, these were adapted from the ASGE guidelines, which really aren't new. They were in 2008 and really has not changed uh, in recent years. But if you look at the, the, you have to look at the patient type and the procedure plan. So if you look at the type of patients that are undergoing an endoscopic procedure, it's really more dependent on the type of procedure than the patient themselves. So if a patient is undergoing a, a percutaneous gastrostomy or jejunostomy tube with the goal being per, to prevent peri- uh, stomal infection, antibiotics are indicated with a high level of evidence. So all of those patients should get pre-procedure antibiotics. If a patient of any kind is undergoing an endoscopic ultrasound with the plan to stick a needle in a cystic lesion, with the goal being to prevent cyst infection, antibiotics are indicated with intermediate-based evidence. Patients who are undergoing an ERCP, and the thought is that there's probably going to be incomplete biliary drainage. Now, this would be someone with 
primary sclerosis and cholangitis, maybe a cholangiocarcinoma. With your goal being to prevent cholangitis, those patients should get antibiotics, again, with weak evidence, but that's typically done in practice. And then cirrhotics with GI bleeding, regardless of whether they um, have ascites or not, and really regardless if you perform an endoscopy or not, those, people, those patients um, should get antibiotics for their GI bleeding, regardless of source, to prevent infection and mortality. So again, they're indicated with a fairly decent amount of uh, evidence. So who should not get antibiotics? So any cardiac condition undergoing any routine endoscopic procedure, so EGD, colonoscopy, flexible sigmoidoscopy, if your goal is to prevent endocarditis, antibiotics are not indicated, and that's based on fairly strong uh, recommendation from observational studies. Similarly, those with prosthetic joints undergoing routine endoscopic procedures with the goal being to prevent septic arthritis, antibiotics are not indicated with that same level of evidence. And similarly, those with synthetic vascular grafts or non-valvular cardiac devices like an AICD or pacemaker, again, undergoing any routine endoscopic procedure with your goal being to prevent infection of those devices, antibiotics are not indicated. So you can see it's really more dependent on the type of procedure that you're going to do rather than the type of patient other than the cirrhotic patients with GI bleeding. So the clinical pearl here are that antibiotics are not needed for routine endoscopic procedure for the prevention of infective endocarditis. All right, next case. And for those of you who have handouts, just so you know, the answers are not in the handout right after the case. They're all at the very end of the handout. I did that for, to prevent wandering eyes from seeing the answers, because that's always disappointing when, you, when your eyes wander to the next slide. So next case is a 43-year-old woman who presents for an evaluation of diarrhea and abdominal pain that she's had for five years. She gets lower abdominal pain and bloating one to two times per week. On those days, she reports three to five loose stools predominantly in the morning or after meals. Stools are non-bloody, non-greasy, and never nocturnal. Stooling brings relief of her pain. She denies weight loss. Her past medical history is unremarkable. She takes no medications and has no family history of GI problems. Her examination is normal. So which of the following is the next best step? No further tests, reassurance. CBC and IgA tissue transglutaminase antibody, stool cultures, EGD with small bowel biopsies, or colonoscopy with random biopsies. All right, so let's see uh, what you responded. Um, this one you might feel is a little tricky. So I just got done telling you that most of the questions we'd gone through uh, talked about a cost-effective approach, and I think this case is the same, but I would argue that option two, the CBC and IGA TTG, is probably the best answer based on the guidelines. So, oops, going back, this patient has irritable bowel syndrome. You could, this is a clinical diagnosis that you can make based on abdominal pain and then altered bowel habits. But we know, as you're familiar with, that celiac disease is common, probably affecting up to 1% of the population. And you know, certainly if this person was anemic, that would warrant a different evaluation as well. So I think doing a CBC and IgA TTG um, before just managing the IBS symptoms would be recommended. So again, if you look at literature from really 2009 to current day, this is a clinical diagnosis for irritable bowel syndrome. So you need to have pain with altered bowel movements. So if you have someone with just significant diarrhea, no abdominal pain, um, you really probably need to think about other diagnoses. But if someone has pain, altered bowel movements, then you go through your checklist of alarm features. So is it of new onset? It is, is it a, a man? Because it's less likely to be irritable bowel syndrome in those patients. Is it new onset after age 50? Do they have blood in their stool, nighttime stooling, weight loss, or family history of either inflammatory bowel disease, GI uh, cancers, or celiac disease? If none of those are present, then the guidelines would recommend it's reasonable to check a complete blood count and an IgA tissue transglutaminase antibody. They say you could check an inflammatory marker like an erythrocyte sedimentation rate or a C-reactive protein, but that's not necessarily strongly recommended. After this limited testing, if that is negative, then you can comfortably arrive at the diagnosis of irritable bowel syn uh, syndrome and manage that patient appropriately.
So in terms of how to categorize, I love this chart. If you don't have this in your office, you should get it. Um, patients actually, when they come to you with bowel complaints, it's helpful to know what they're describing. And so I think a picture is worth a thousand words. So having them point to their bowel habit. So certainly when we're talking about diarrhea, predominant irritable bowel, we're talking about the things on the bottom of the um, chart. But some patients with irritable bowel can have constipation predominant symptoms. So their stools are typically hard and lumpy, type one or two. Um, those with diarrhea predominant irritable bowel syndrome will have loose or watery stools. And then they have this typical chart that you can kind of plot your patient on. So what percentage of their stools are loose or watery? Which ones are hard and lumpy? So if they're typically all loose and watery, they have diarrhea predominant IBS. If they're typically hard or lumpy, they have constipation predominant. And if they have a combination of both, it's one of those kind of alternators or mixed IBS type of patterns. And I think then you manage their symptoms based on which pattern they have. So the clinical pearl here is diarrhea predominant irritable bowel syndrome is a diagnosis that can be made with little exclusionary testing required other than a CBC and IgA tissue transglutaminase antibody in the absence of alarm features. So I tricked you a little bit on that one. but. Uh... Case number six, a 46-year-old woman is evaluated in the emergency room for sudden onset epigastric pain, nausea, and vomiting. She is healthy and on no medications. Exam reveals her to be afebrile, tachycardic, obese, with decreased bowel sounds and tenderness in the epigastric region. Serum uh, white blood cell count is 14.7 and lipase is 7,800. Liver tests are normal. So which of the following is the next best step? CT scan of the abdomen, IV antibiotics, total parenteral nutrition, ultrasound of the abdomen, or serum triglycerides. All right, so let's see what everybody selected. Good, so 54% selected an ultrasound of the abdomen, which I think is the best answer here. So certainly she has pancreatitis. We can tell that based on her clinical features and her elevation of her pancreatic uh, biomarker, and she has clinical features of pancre pancreatitis. So the, question, or the diagnosis probably isn't in doubt, so why do we do an ultrasound? Well, again, these uh, guidelines came out in the last uh, year, I believe, of acute pancreatitis. I have the reference on the last slide. So to make a diagnosis of acute pancreatitis, you really need two of three criteria. So you certainly need to have abdominal pain consistent with the disease, and then you need to have one of two things, either a serum amylase and or lipase greater than three times the upper li uh, normal limit for your lab, or characteristic findings on abdominal imaging. So based on this case, she had consistent clinical features and her lipase was certainly above the upper limit of normal by more than three times. So in her case, you don't need to do CT imaging um, to look for other causes or to confirm the diagnosis. So in a case like this, CT or MRI of the pancreas is only needed in those with unclear diagnosis based on symptoms or, or laboratory studies or in those who failed to improve after about 72 hours. Every patient, however, should have a transabdominal ultrasound to look for uh, gallstones, and that's because gallstones really make up, you know, one of the most common causes of acute pancreatitis next to alcohol consumption. So everybody should have that because if they have that, they really need to have a cholecystectomy to prevent another bout of acute pancreatitis. In the absence of someone having gallstones or in the absence of significant alcohol intake, that's when a serum triglyceride level should be obtained, looking for a level of greater than 1,000. But we know even in the acute setting, that serum triglyceride level may not be truly reflective of what they are in the steady state because their triglyceride level may actually drop in a setting of acute pancreatitis just because of the fat, necrosis, and saponification that you get in the pancreas. So if someone has a level and you check it and it's 600 and you don't have any other reason why they had pancreatitis, probably worth rechecking that triglyceride level in follow-up um, in the outpatient setting. Probably the most important thing by far and away we can do for these patients is hydrate them aggressively. So aggressive hydration, and the guidelines define this as 200, 250 to 500 cc's an hour of isotonic crystalloid needs to be given. Um, obviously, if they have significant cardiovascular disease or renal disease, you'll adjust accordingly and you'll follow their clinical parameters very closely. 
the guidelines say that there, there may be some benefit of lactated ringers um, just because of the, the alkaline nature of the solution, but you have to be careful because of the other electrolytes that are in there and watch those levels closely. So we know that the fluid is the most beneficial within the first 12 to 24 hours. So, you know, if you don't think, if, if they're not started immediately in the ER upon coming to the floor and you don't think about it till the next day, you've probably lost some of the benefit of that early hydration. So really start these early, start these aggressively, and then back down on fluid after 48 hours as they, as they continue to improve clinically. And the goal of the fluids and the way that you can assess if you're adequately hydrating is you should see a slow decrease in the blood urea nitrogen or that we always used to follow the hematocrit. Blood urea nitrogen is probably a very helpful marker. And people who have an elevated blood urea nitrogen on presentation usually of 25 or higher at a high risk of severe pancreatitis and those who do not have a falling level after a day or two also are at high risk of severe pancreatitis. We only need to do ERCP in those with biliary pancreatitis and concomitant acute cholangitis. And we like to do that early within the first 24 hours because after 24 hours, the periampula uh, region becomes very edematous. It makes it very hard to cannulate. It's not needed for other uh, cases of biliary pancreatitis. Oftentimes, the stone will either have passed by the time um, within the first 24 hours, but obviously, if their bilirubin continues to rise, their white count continues to rise. Um, then ERCP would be indicated. Antibiotics are also something worth mentioning because a lot of patients get antibiotics unnecessarily for acute pancreatitis. So they certainly are indicated if someone has features of cholangitis because of a, a biliary etiology or if they have documented infected necrosis. So it's been sampled, we know it's infected. However, they're not indicated for prophylaxis of just severe acute pancreatitis, and they're not recommended just for the presence of necrosis. So certainly this has been a change of paradigm over the years. I know when I was a trainee, we would try to estimate the percent of necrosis and give antibiotics if they had over 30% necrosis, for example, but you don't need to give them for necrosis unless it's been documented to be infected. And that's been based on meta-analyses and other supporting evidence. What about nutrition? So the recent guidelines, again, these came out in 2013, say that for people with mild pancreatitis, oral feeding can actually be started immediately if their nausea, vomiting, and pain have started to resolve. And probably starting a low-fat solid diet is as safe as start. We always start everyone on a clear liquid diet, right? But it's probably just as safe to start a low-fat solid diet as it is as a clear liquid diet. And that probably allows us to um, get people out of the hospital um, more quickly. If someone has severe pancreatitis, however, uh, and you anticipate after the first few days that they're not going to take adequate oral intake, then enteral nutrition is recommended, and we know that that can be helpful in preventing infective complications in these patients. And studies have shown that either nasogastric or nasal jejunal feeding is comparable. So I think in the past, we always really strive for nasal jejunal feedings, but a nasogastric feeding tube is just fine in the setting. And we should really avoid parenteral nutrition unless the enteral feeding is not, you're not able to get to goal or they're not able to meet the caloric needs or they have a significant ileus preventing enteral feeds. So again, that guideline is quite helpful. Probably not a whole lot of new information there, but I think it solidifies a lot of the things that have come out over the years regarding acute pancreatitis. So the clinical pearl here is that aggressive IV hydration and ultrasound imaging of the abdomen are required for all patients with acute pancreatitis with CT imaging, antibiotics, and TPN reserved for specific clinical settings. All right, case seven, a 56-year-old man presents for a yearly examination. He's overweight but has no diabetes or dyslipidemia. Workup for elevated hepatic transaminases reveals a fatty liver on ultrasound and steatohepatitis on biopsy. Which of the following would you recommend? Metformin, vitamin E, ursodeoxycholic acid, omega-3 fatty acids, or rosiglitazone? Responses are a little slower on this one. This is a tough question, but I think the importance of this one is to talk about why certain medications maybe are not as helpful, uh, more important than probably the one that is. 
But let's see what people selected. So good, 38% chose vitamin E, which I think is, is the best answer in this case. The next most commonly selected choice was omega-3 fatty acids. I can't say that that won't be the right answer going forward. I think just at this point, we may not have enough evidence um, for the treatment of NASH in this patient. Certainly, it could be helpful for treatment of hypertriglyceridemia. But for this case specifically, vitamin E is probably the best answer. So let's just spend a few minutes talking about medical therapy and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Again, a guideline came out in the, in the recent year regarding medical, or just NAFLD in general, but part of that section was on medical therapy. So just going through the medications that I listed, metformin has no significant effect on liver histology and is not recommended as a specific treatment for adults with non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Now certainly they have, may have other indications for metformin, but you shouldn't use it just to uh, help treat their non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Pioglitazone can be used to treat steatohepatitis in patients with biopsy-proven NASH. However, most of the patients were in non-diabetic patients, and we know that the long-term safety and efficacy in patients with NASH is really not established, so it wouldn't necessarily be recommended um, in that instance. Ursodeoxycholic acid, again, another choice, is not recommended for treatment of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Omega-3 fatty acids, which I know some of you selected, are not recommended for fatty liver disease treatment. Again, it's probably premature. We'll probably be revising that as we go forward, and in the next version of these guidelines, that may be changed. But like I said, it could be used first line to treat hypertriglyceridemia in these patients if they have that. Vitamin E, however, improves liver histology in non-diabetic patients, which this one was, with biopsy-proven non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, and the guidelines recommend that this should be considered first-line therapy. Now, certainly that this raises questions about the potential harm, so to speak, of vitamin E therapy, because I know studies have come, in, come out showing, should we all take vitamin E, and there's probably risk of that. But in this select patient population, that's probably the best that we have uh, for them, other than managing lifestyle and other health-related issues they have. However, until further data is available, vitamin E is not recommended to treat NASH in diabetic patients, um, which represents a majority of these patients. Um, those with fatty liver disease without a biopsy or those with um, NASH-related cirrhosis or cryptogenic cirrhosis. Again, just trying to offset the risk of vitamin E therapy in those patients. Um, just a few other pointers. Um, patients with fatty liver disease should not consume heavy alcohol. That probably goes without saying. And if your patient then follows that with, well, how much alcohol can I drink? Then they may probably have a, they could potentially have a combination of alcoholic liver disease and NAFLD. So you probably want to go back to ask how much they typically were drinking if they're asking those clarifying questions on how much alcohol they can drink. And these guidelines don't really spell out what is a safe amount of alcohol for someone with liver disease from fatty liver disease. We know that statins can be very comfortably used to treat dyslipidemia in patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, given the lack of evidence showing an increased risk of drug-induced liver injury. And actually, a, a guideline just came out in the last two months in the American Journal of Gastroenterology on drug-induced liver injury as well. Um, certainly, though, so you should comfortably, I think there's a lot of hesitation to use a statin in someone with liver disease, but you can comfortably do that, um, and their liver tests are probably, in fact, a recent study showed that their liver biochemistries in someone with liver disease and elevated uh, transaminases at baseline with NAFLD actually probably have a drop in their transaminases um, on a statin, probably because you're improving their cholesterol levels and their fat content in their liver. However, so this is again telling you you can use a statin comfortably to treat cholesterol issues and fatty liver disease, but until there's randomized controlled trials showing us there's important endpoints, you should not use a statin just to treat non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So you can use it to treat the cholesterol issue that most of these patients have, but you're not really using it to treat the NASH. So the clinical pearl here is that vitamin E should be considered first-line therapy in non-diabetic adults with biopsy-proven NASH, but is not recommended to treat NASH in diabetic patients, fatty liver disease without a liver biopsy, NASH-related cirrhosis, or cryptogenic cirrhosis. And again, I think probably a second pearl is that you can comfortably use statin therapy in people with fatty liver disease.
All right, we probably have time for one more. I have two more cases. We probably have time at least for one more. Um, these are maybe some more unique cases, but I think they're things that I've seen referred to our practice not uncommonly, so good to be aware of. This is a 32-year-old man is admitted for dehydration related to nausea and vomiting, which he's had intermittently for six months. Symptoms are worse in the morning and associated with epigastric pain. He's lost 15 pounds. Bowel movements are normal. Past medical surgical history is unremarkable. He takes no medications. He smokes one pack of cigarettes per day for five years and uses marijuana several times per week for three years. He has mild epigastric tenderness on exam. His CBC reveals mild leukocytosis, but his electrolytes, liver biochemistries, serum lipase, calcium, and thyroid are all normal. Abdominal plane film is normal, as is a right upper quadrant ultrasound. Upper endoscopy is normal. So which is the next best step? Mesenteric angiogram, advise cholecystectomy, order a hot shower, CT enterography or gastric scintigraphy, which is a gastric emptying study. This one's probably a bit trickier because you either know it or you don't. So don't feel badly if you don't understand why some of these options are even uh, options to pick. But probably more bizarre the option, the probably more likely it is to be the correct one, right? So 50% uh, of you picked up on ordering a hot shower, which uh, in a patient like this that I've had is exactly what I've done in the hospital setting, put an order in for the nurse to give the patient a hot shower. So um, why would that be? What this patient has is something called cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. So cannabis, we know, is the most widely used illicit drug worldwide. And certainly I think this is important because now with the legalization of medical marijuana, we'll probably see more and more cases of this. We know that a metabolite in marijuana is an antiemetic. So this seems kind of odd that they would get this paradoxical reaction with nausea, vomiting. But chronic use in select patients, and we can't really predict which select patients, which is challenging, um, can lead to this cannabinoid hyperemesis. And the reason that this probably happens is the metabolites are lipophilic, and it binds certain regions of the brain, specifically the hypothalamic pituitary axis. And so it leads to not only the nausea, vomiting, but it can also lead to thermodysregulation for these patients. They get very diaphoretic. Um, and they also get significant benefit from taking a hot shower. So this is very under-recognized, it's under-diagnosed. Many of these patients will undergo an entire battery of tests and retests to come up with a diagnosis when taking a history and trying to counsel them about this diagnosis can be the most helpful. Now that can be challenging because you can imagine some of these patients think that the marijuana is helping their nausea. And while it may have been initially, then later it presents to the cycle um, that you need to break. So there's some proposed criteria for cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome that came out two years ago. So essential for the diagnosis, they need to be on long-term cannabis use. And I'll so show you some charts of what the mean uh, duration was. But major features include cyclical nausea and vomiting. These patients look like someone with cyclical vomiting syndrome. Um, they basically have relief of symptoms with hot shower and hot bathing. So there's many case reports out there of people who have basically had skin burns and scalded their body because the hot shower is so therapeutic for the vomiting. Um, they've exhausted hot water supplies of their house, some of the hospitals. The nurse will find a patient in the shower continuously. Those are the things that you should pick up on and ask about. Um, they often have abdominal pain and they usually have weekly use of their marijuana at least. Other supportive features, they're typically young patients, less than age 50. It's not uncommon to have fairly significant weight loss of greater than five kilos or more. They tend to have a morning predominance of symptoms, typically normal bowel habits, although that could be varied, but certainly if someone has severe diarrhea, you probably need to look for other things causing that. And you probably need to do at least some basic, or at least all of the tests that they've had, which typically they will by the time they've seen uh, many of us, um, should be normal. So you can see that in this first bar graph, this shows the typical distribution of the number of years people have used marijuana. So you can see, you know, more than two thirds have used it for less than five years. So they don't need to have used it for 10, 20 years to get this. You know, a third of them have been using it for less than a year. So I think, again, that's helpful to know. 
This also tells you what's the average use, meaning number of times per week. You can see about 60% use it daily, but people might only use it one to two times per week and can get this as well. So once you establish that this may be the diagnosis, there's no test to prove it other than to have them stop using marijuana and their symptoms should improve. The thing that's a little challenging is the longer they have used the marijuana, the longer they need to stop before they're going to have improvement of symptoms. And some people I've seen have used urine tests to try to prove whether the patient has actually stopped the marijuana or not. And if the your drug test comes up positive, they blame them that they really didn't follow the medical advice. But you have to remember that checking urine uh, testing, depending on the test that you do, um, it's cheap, it's widely available, but it probably for these patients establishes past use depending on the chronicity. We know these metabolites, just like they deposit in the brain and other areas, they persist in body fluids proportional to the degree of use in terms of chronicity. So someone who uses it intermittently, their drug uh, screen in their urine will clear after seven to 10 days of stopping. A heavy user, though, it may take two to four weeks. And someone who's a chronic user over years, it may take several months. So again, if someone comes to you and says, I've stopped using marijuana for a month, I'm still having symptoms, and you check a urine drug screen, you see it's positive, you can't blame them or make them feel guilty that they're, maybe they are still using. But you can't, you can't uh, know that for certain because that drug screen maybe have been from the, their prior use. So the clinical pearl here is that cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome presents with cyclical nausea and vomiting and abdominal pain in chronic users of marijuana with hot water bathing providing characteristic relief, major and supportive criteria can assist in making the diagnosis. So the last case we might just go through without the use of the audience response system just for um, to, we can get this done in two minutes. So this is a 36 year old woman who presents with constant right upper quadrant pain for nine months she describes it as dull, burning in the right upper quadrant without radiation. Eating does not change symptoms. Her medical history is unremarkable. She's had ultrasounds and liver tests that are unremarkable. And her exam reveals focal tenderness in the right upper quadrant. Having her lift both of her legs simultaneously off the bed, and you may wonder why do we do that, results in worsening of the tenderness. So which of the following is the next best step? So in this case, this is a case of abdominal wall pain. Again, something very commonly that we see referred. And in these patients, a trigger point injection can be quite therapeutic. So chronic abdominal wall pain accounts for up to 30% of chronic abdominal pain in a referral practice. And we think that this is often from entrapment of anterior cutaneous nerves in many patients. You may see this tenderness right in the area of a scar, like a cholecystectomy scar, but it may be unrelated to a scar and it may be from other etiologies. The right upper quadrant is probably the most common location as long as along the lateral abdominus rectus. And you, again, you can imagine these patients, kind of like the last patient, undergo a whole myriad or battery of tests for their abdominal pain, whereas the, the exam can be quite helpful in suggesting it. So how can you discriminate this? Well, you can usually have them localize their pain with a few fingers, and it's most intense right at that point. It's a constant site of tenderness. They may tell you that their clothes, it feels like a sunburn at times, their clothes bothers, a belt bothers. It's very superficial on palpation. It's usually, again, small diameter, usually less than several centimeters. So my husband works in our, our rehab group and does these trigger points. So he says when we send in patients where the pain is here, a trigger point's not going to help. It has to be a focal area of pain. So again, make sure that a patient can actually put two fingers on their pain and doesn't point to the entire abdominal wall. Um, and we know that if the tenderness increases by tensing of the abdominal wall, that would be indicative. So this is called a Carnet sign. So you have the patient lay in a relaxed supine position, and then you usually I have them do a crunch. So bring their head off the bed. You could have them bring their legs off the bed, although I think that's a little bit more challenging. And if it's a visceral related pain, there, and you keep your finger right on that point of tenderness. If it's visceral pain, that should get better with them tensing their abdominal wall because their muscles are protecting and guarding against that tender viscera. Where if it's abdominal wall pain, crunching their abdominal wall makes their pain significantly worse, and then relaxing relieves their pain. So that increasing pain with tensing of the abdominal wall is a positive Carnet sign. And you can see the sensitivity and specificity is probably as good as all of the diagnostic tests we have for some other conditions. Most of these patients will improve with a local uh, trigger point anesthetic of a steroid and a local anesthetic. Probably a third of patients will require re-injection within a number of months. It's highly variable. 
Um, and I think the important thing to know, though, is once someone has been established to have abdominal wall pain, it doesn't mean that protects them against getting other organic diseases. So certainly if they present with a change of symptoms, um, don't overlook visceral causes of abdominal pain that may develop later. So the clinical pearl here is that chronic abdominal wall pain should be considered in patients with chronic abdominal pain and exam discriminators, such as a positive Carnet sign. And in those cases, a trigger point injection may be quite helpful. So that's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions that people might have. How long does it take for the cannabinoid hyperemesis stuff to go away? Again, it will be it will be dependent on how long they've used marijuana. So people, you know, depend, and it also depends on how frequent their attacks are. So you may not know even if they stop marijuana for a week or a month if their symptoms were every few weeks. You may not know that right for a length of time. So some people may have improvement after just stopping a week or two, but some people may stop and have symptoms still for several months while those metabolites are being excreted from their body. I, I find that for these patients, probably the most helpful thing is to pull up this article or an article on cannabinoid hyperemesis because they oftentimes they may think that you're just making this up, right? That you know, you're blaming their marijuana on all their symptoms. But I think if you show them the literature that this really is an entity, and especially when you show them that this, some of the features that they have, the hot water bathing, and it, I mean, sometimes you just show them that and they're like, wow, that describes my symptoms. It's conv more convincing to them. And you just need to tell them to be patient, that it may take months of stopping it before their symptoms improve, but it ought to. Now, if someone goes three, four months and they're still having the same degree of symptoms and, and, and or worsening, then you probably need to make sure to go back to the drawing board to say, is there something else going on on top of it? But you can imagine it makes it very hard um, you know, in that setting um, to subtract that out until they've stopped their marijuana. So having them stop that for you to know if they've really clinically improved over several months is important. All right, thank you for your time and attention.